Wonderful. I'd like to invite Xavier to join us at the podium. Xavier is the Regional Health and HIV Advisor for UNESCO in Western Central Africa region, and he's based in Senegal. Today, he's going to be talking to us about how we can harness the education sector to improve HIV and SRH outcomes for adolescents. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, speakers uh, very often start uh, their presentation saying how pleased and honored they are to be uh, in the room. I am pleased and honored to be in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really terrific time yesterday, and I don't know if I like the most, what I like the most, if that was the presenters or the audience. It was really a wonderful day. Thank you. And above all, thank you for coming back today for our presentations. <laughs> So harnessing the education sector. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, I, I control this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm in control. <laughs> there are so many ways that the education sector, in what well, the education sector can contribute to the response to HIV in so many ways. School has so many different effects. It reduces exposure to the risk of HIV. Winnie said it yesterday. Uh, completing secondary education reduces by half the risk of exposure to HIV among adolescent girls. School delays the age of marriage. It reduces exposure to sexual and gender-based violence. It increases women's and girls' chances of being financially secure and independent. And I think that by now we're convinced that it is an important aspect of the response to HIV. It equips learners with knowledge, attitudes, and skills to stay healthy. And we can manage this through a wide range of, of interventions by making schools safer, healthier, and more inclusive. For instance, through the response to school-related gender-based violence. We can make interventions to, read, uh, to um, manage, well, to prevent and respond to pregnancies in school settings. We can respond to COVID-19 and other outbreaks, which has uh, very bad effects on uh, the, the response to, to HIV and other negative consequences. We can have social protection programs, school health and nutrition programs, and learners can be empowered to take their own health into, into their own hands through comprehensive sexuality education, for instance. Let me give you a few examples of uh, programs that can be implemented in school settings into a little, a little bit more details. For instance, the response to school-related gender-based violence. But first, what is school-related gender-based violence? It is any kind of violence, be it physical, psychological, sexual, that is um, the result of power asymmetries and that is caused by um, gender norms and that justifies the, 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 the violence and which affect differently boys and girls. For instance, girls are more likely to be victims of sexual violence, while boys can be more likely, are more likely to be victims of physical violence. And to respond to school-related gender-based violence, there is a need to act at many different levels. Leadership, we need laws, we need policies, we need sector-wide analysis and planning. And for those of us who are not from the education sector, if something is not in the education sector planning, it's not institutionalized. It's not sustainable. It need, needs to be there to be there in the long run and to have the means to be implemented. To respond to school-related gender-based violence, we need to act on the environment. We need separate toilets for boys and girls which are secure and comfortable enough. We need um, water and soap to wash hands. We need um, spaces which are inclusive for all learners we need safe spaces and we need codes of conduct and regulations. To respond to school-related gender-based violence, we also act at the level of teaching and learning, curricula, teacher training, 
um, students so that they know, both teachers and students, learners, what to do in case of violence, how to prevent violence, how to identify situations which are a risk uh, of uh, violence, and how to develop skills to do that. We need to bring responses into schools. Into schools. Uh, there is a need to be able to detect cases, to report them, uh, there is a need to have counselling services and uh, referral mechanisms so that um, victims can be oriented, victims or, or people who are testimonies of violence can, can use health services, protection services, law enforcement services, all in partnership with communities. We know that if communities do not agree to report violence, it is not going to be reported and that will not work with young people themselves. And finally, the, the, the last component is uh, evaluation and research. To monitor progress, implementation, uh, to make sure that uh, education management and information systems can collect data on a periodic basis, and to make studies of prevalence of violence and, um, and research on the effect of programs. And the same components can be applied to many other different uh, interventions in school settings for health education. For instance, responding to COVID-19 and other outbreaks. So then again, we have to go through policies and education sector plans to make sure that they explicitly reference, make references to outbreaks and uh, the means to respond to them. In terms of the environment, we have hygiene protocols, physical distancing measures, water and sanitation, school feeding, for instance. School feeding can be particularly important to bring girls back to school when uh, after school have been closed. In terms of teaching and learning, then again, we have to train teachers for them to know about uh, COVID-19 and other uh, causes of outbreaks uh, to, and to prepare learners to be able to face um, those outbreaks and those epidemics. And they, the teachers also need to be able to, to do remote learning when schools are closed. In terms of uh, responses, we need to be able to um, detect cases, to report them, to manage them, and to refer them to uh, services, uh, which comes into partnerships. And then again, we have to work with the health sector, with the protection uh, social sector and to work with communities uh, to, uh, then again to, uh, to make sure that girls can go back to school. And in terms of monitoring, we need to know how many cases have been detected. Uh, we need research to know how uh, the response can be improved uh, and learn from outbreak management. The same components come back when we go to, when we want to respond to early and unintended pregnancies in school settings. Um, I will not go again through the different uh, components of the response, but um, there are several common points, not only in the component themselves, but the way they're applied. For instance, in terms of the environment, a safe, inclusive environment will contribute to reduce early and unintended pregnancies because many early and unintended pregnancies are the result of violence, sexual violence. So there is a complementarity between this type of the response to early and unintended pregnancies and the response to COVID-19 and the response to, um, to, to, to uh, school-related gender-based violence. And it makes sense to have um, a planning and thinking about all these different types of responses uh, together in order to have a holistic response. Then again, we need referral systems and counseling services in schools. We need um, um, links with the services, health services, and um, which are both in schools or out of school. Well, there are different models for health services, but we cannot effectively respond to early and unintended pregnancies without them. And then again, we need that data on girls' prevention in school, pregnancy-relating dropouts, the application of policies, and the effectiveness of programs. Now, you might argue that the main business of the education sector is teaching and learning itself. 
Ooh, that's, uh, my prompt is, uh, has just disappeared while well, the other one is really far away. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'll sue the, the, the people who made those glasses, they're not working effectively. <laughs> All right, so um, teaching and learning of comprehensive sexuality education. What is sexuality, comprehensive sexuality education? Comprehensive sexuality education is a curriculum-based process of teaching and learning, thank you, learning about the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. It aims to equip children and young people knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that will empower them to realize their health, well-being, and dignity, to develop respectful social and sexual relationships, to consider how their choices affect their own well-being and that of others, and to understand and ensure the protection of their rights throughout their lives. And when we speak about the curriculum-based process, this applies to both in and out of school settings. It's not because we're doing it out of school that we shouldn't have a clear curriculum to support the, the program. CSC is effective. There is quite a lot of uh, evidence uh, saying that CSC has positive effect on young people's knowledge, attitudes, self-esteem, and behavior. CSC does not increase sexual activity, sexual risk-taking behavior, or HIV infection rates. It's very important because many people believe that speaking about sexuality is going to lead adolescents and young people to have a more active sexual life. It is not the case. No more than speaking about tobacco will uh, uh, incentivate adolescents and young people to smoke. The more you speak about tobacco, the less they will speak, they will smoke and some similar effects can be observed with sexuality education. Abstinence is a very important element of CSC, but abstinence-only programs are not effective, and there is really a lot of evidence to support that. Gender-focused programs are more effective than gender-blind ones in achieving health outcome. I think we had a w wonderful presentation yesterday by Siri, and I'm really grateful for that because it makes the point very clear. And finally, programs uh, complemented with non-discriminatory uh, youth responsive, I like that yesterday, youth responsive services and parental engagement are most impactful. So the PSC per se will not have an effect unless it is linked with health services. And then again, we go back to the different components of any intervention in health education. CSC delays the age of the first sexual intercourse, quality CSC, I should say. Decrease the frequency of intercourse, decreases the number of sexual partners, and increases sex, safer sex practices. And then again, CSC does not increase sexual activity. How can we improve programs in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, the, through implementing large-scale programs that we have learned that there is a need to strengthen the gender component of CSC to make it more effective. As we've uh, uh, heard yesterday, um, when delivered as intended, CSC well, has a strong gender component and the gender component makes that it builds awareness of how gender norms are shaped by cultural, social, and biological differences and similarities uh, the gender component encourages critical thinking on gender norms that influence inequality, gender-based violence, and discrimination. It encourages equitable relationships based on respectful sexual choices, free from coercion and violence. And it recommends an approach that recognizes gender diversity. However, gender is not sufficiently addressed in curricula to make CSE effective. And we can see that on the chart that, uh, that is on the slide, where we can see that analyzing the content of the sexuality education program, in this case in Togo, uh, for the age range of from 12 to 15 years old, we can see that uh, the elements on gender in the curriculum are among the, the, the least well covered, uh, together with social norms, which are so important to develop critical thinking. 
So this is an aspect where we can improve the quality of sexuality education programs to make them more effective. Another aspect, and uh, we, we talked about that uh, uh, during dinner yesterday, is uh, teacher training. Teachers often do not feel sufficiently prepared to deliver CSE. And it is a key aspect of the quality of the program and their effectiveness. So there, there is definitely a need to invest in that. And one of the ways to do that is to develop lesson plans and uh, prepare teachers to develop, to, 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 um, to use those lesson plans. Um, it's like CSC key in hand, keys in hand. It makes the life of teachers um, uh, easier. And we can complete that with uh, digital uh, platforms such as smartphone applications. And we have really good examples with uh, TuneMe, for instance. You can look for it um, on Play Store or Hello Ado uh, for the French-speaking Sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, I have 14 seconds left and it's going down. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, conclusion. So we have seen that uh, there are many common elements of uh, health education programs. We have the legal and policy frameworks, physical environment and regulations, teaching and learning, school-based res responses, links with services and communities, and monitoring and evaluation and learning. And all that together helps uh, responding while well, having strong CSE programs, good responses to, to early and unintended pregnancies, school-related gender-based violence, and to outbreaks, uh, outbreaks. And all those programs are in synergy, create synergies among themselves and complete themselves. And in order to make these programs stronger, we can invest in teacher training and support, not only training, but making sure that they are support as they, as they deliver uh, the teaching and we can make programs more gender responses, responsive, and that will improve their effectiveness. Thank you very much.